I am a Scottish extremist. This speech, or I call it in solidarity we trust. In the last interview given by Abdullah Oshalun before his imprisonment, 15 Kurds were on trial in France, accused of being terrorists. So this was about 25 years ago. Deals were being done by the powers and everybody knew it. Ochilum was asked why Kurdish people had such a bad image. His reply to that question was matter of fact. France is making a lot of concessions to Turkey. There was nothing to add to that, but he did. He said, we the Kurds, we have nothing to give except themselves, flesh and blood, their lives. It has been this way since the dirty deals were done more than a hundred years ago, when the French state and the British began the process back in 1916. The Kurdish Workers' Party was formed in November 1978 Estella Schmidt, a friend of mine of the Peace in Kurdistan Initiative, she sent me a poem to commemorate this, and she dedicated the poem to Abdullah Ochilin, not in any grand terms, as a glorious leader, not as a saint and not as a martyr, not even as a hero, as a man from whom she has learned one who works through what he can as best he can, one whose commitment has become his life, which is something that could be said of Estella Schmidt herself and of many others who are not Kurdish. There is nothing exceptional about this commitment in that sense. We are human beings, people that are always in struggle, fighting to survive, for the survival of our families, our communities, fighting for our language, our culture, and others are with them in solidarity. Commitment, can we engage? How do we engage? Each moment is a concern. How we act, can we act? What do we do? Must we give everything? What if there are people we love whose lives we share, who rely on us, immediate families, our communities? The most basic issues, and for many, these are daily issues, day by day by day, learning, teaching, expressing who we are and what we do how we live in the relationships formed and how we move together in solidarity. Abdullah Ochilin is not the only person locked up for this length of time. A young man was locked up at the age of 22 in 1994. His name is Elan Sami Chomak. He is no longer young. 30 years have passed. 30 years, the horror that any state authority would do such a thing, almost without thought. Their power is absolute. A 22-year-old Kurdish man, a poet, there is no special case for poets and artists. I was 22 when I met my wife. The same year I began writing, more than 50 years ago. I have two daughters, both are older. 
than the poet I'm talking about. I have grandchildren, 30 years in prison from the age of 22. What kind of horror is this? People from outside don't ask why Abdullah Ocalan's in prison. They do ask about Elan Sami Chomak. Why? Now, why is the wrong question? Thousands of people are locked up in Turkish prisons. Tens of thousands. Who knows how many? There is no point discussing why. None of that matters. They are political prisoners. They are in prison because this suits the interest of global authority, taking its lead from the Turkish state. It is contemptible. It is a disgraceful thing. Words like contemptible and disgraceful are good in this context. They have no application outside of our species. Disgraceful actions of this nature dishonour ourselves and our kind. Nobody will feel this more than Turkish people. This behaviour brings disgrace to them upon their country and their culture. How many Turks are in prison? I remember being involved in a campaign like 25 years ago. And then it was Ismail Besicki and some of the older people remember Besicki, who was a Turkish sociologist. He spent most of his adult years in prison. How many Turkish people in these prisons? Tens of thousands? I don't know. But I feel in solidarity with them and their struggle. We must learn to distinguish between the people of Turkey and the Turkish state, between the people of a country and the authority exercised over them. I don't see that Abdullah Ocalan was betrayed by the Greeks, not the Italians, not the Germans, not the British, not the Kenyans, not even the Americans. It is way, way beyond that. This was a conglomerate of interests, corporate business interests, global banking, fiscal interests, the political interests of nation states, and a variety of other groups, bodies, and political formations. Who knows how many? I call this the global conglomerate. Each has its own chain of command, its own infrastructure. And I don't forget those lurking in the shadows either, intelligence and security agents, and I'm sure there are a couple here today. Welcome. We speak in freedom. Sorry, that's anger. <laughs> well, we'll have to take our chances. Thanks. I can hold it. I hold one. Can I hold this? Don't call this a conspiracy. There is no conspiracy. Talk of conspiracies is simplistic. It weakens the struggle. We have to know reality as best we can. I don't underestimate how difficult this is. The global conglomerate functions by consensus, no vote taking. The global conglomerate never take votes. Shared interest brings its own authority, similar to class interest, but much more powerful. Shared interest is the nearest thing to solidarity the ruling elite has in its possession. And for the ruling elite, that is what it is, a possession. For them, everything is a property. Do you manage? <laughs> I'll just shout, I shall shout into this. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, because I'm going to sing a song after this. 
for the ruling elite, this is what it is, a possession. I'm talking about solidarity. Everything is a property. Emotional states, fellowship, sympathy, passion, even the senses, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smiling, these are commodified, transformed into properties, there to be given or taken away, bestowed as an act of charity or denied. This global conglomerate, as I see it, takes the form of an empire, drawing together strategies, theories, analyses. The network is all important. People learning from within that, sharing their own knowledge. Authority resides with the CEOs, the chief executive officers. There is none higher. I draw attention to the World Economic Forum, the WEF, people here will know of it. It was launched 50 years ago to introduce European firms to American management strategies. Their position is stated clearly. A globalized world is best managed by a self-elected coalition of multinational corporations, governments, and civil society organizations too. I'm going to repeat that. The World Economic Forum believes that a globalized world is best managed by a self-selected coalition of multinational corporations, governments, and civil society organizations. There are very few interests so elemental as a partnership between nation state and corporate business. Lockheed Martin is the best example I can think of. They are in working partnership with more than 35 countries around the world, some more heavily than others. Turkey, obviously, USA, controlling interest, Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Anywhere you can think of, political scandals, bribery, charges, all standard practice. Membership is invitation only to the WEF. Regional conferences are convened throughout the world. Many takes place based in Switzerland. People will know this history. The WEF members are inculcated and equipped with an ideological framework, a philosophy of action. They seek to improve the state of the world by engaging business, political, academic, and other leaders of society to shape global, regional, and industry agendas. Policies are discussed, what is possible. Likely situations are discussed, how can we bring them to bear. Potential conflict situations are discussed, how are they put to rest? Its membership reaches through 54 or more countries. They even have a self-styled youth wing. The Young Global Leaders, honestly, that's their name. More than, a, more than 1,400 members are involved in this, 120 nationalities. A large number of those belong to countries and former colonies of the British Empire and other empires. That is, that is what happens before countries of former empires regain their so-called independence, like places like South Africa. The deals are all done before freedom is given to them, bestowed upon them as an act of charity. Empire's a good way to think of it. Imperialists, they don't capture countries. They don't need to. They capture the tribal chiefs, the clan chiefs, local monarchies, aristocracies, the religious authorities, the most powerful gangsters. That's who the empires recruit. There's no need to get the people. And these local leaders take care of their own people. They stick them into concentration camps, exterminate a few thousand here and there, they force them to work in slave conditions. 
anything is okay as long as it doesn't interfere with the business of empire. Wise rulers don't worry too much about unity. The only thing they worry about is unity of command. The clan chief is still the clan chief. The, still, the king is still the king. The only thing is they too have a boss. How do these transactions occur within the global community, the global conglomerate? Rather? I'll give you an example. The chief executive officer issues a statement. The statement properly framed has the effect of a command, but not in law. Liability is not with the, the chief executive officer. Each link in the chain draws their own conclusions from the statement. A course of action is required, but not demanded within this statement. Military commanders are not ordered to commit genocide. They are presented with a beginning and an end. The middle is theirs to resolve. They are functionaries. Authority presents them with the desired outcome. How this is accomplished is a function of their command. In the wake of the Iran-Iraq war, the operation known as the ANFO campaign was executed by the Iraqi state on its own Kurdish population, 1987-1989. The military commander was Hassan al-Majid, cousin of Saddam Hussein. He was questioned on the disappearance of 200,000 Kurdish people. They disappeared. Al-Majid, he was questioned about it, and he became impatient. He was impatient with the international questioners. And then he was furious. He was really furious. He had a job to do. This is the job. And this is a quotation. I will kill them all with chemical weapons. Who is going to say anything? Am I supposed to keep them in good shape? Take good care of them? No, I will bury them. Then they asked me to put this enormous number of people. Where did I put them? Where am I supposed to put this enormous number of people? I started to distribute them among the governorates. I had to send bulldozers hither and thither. He brooks no criticism from those who don't grasp reality. He does the dirty work. That is the job of the military. They prepare the way. The more ruthlessly the power is exercised, the greater the lesson taught to the indigenous people. Not only are the spoils the greater, the security is guaranteed for years to come. All these fine, upstanding citizens of the world who invest in the global defense industry, relax. The global oil industry, the global chemical industry, the global mining industry, relax. Al-Majid doesn't bother to conceal his contempt. The international community, fuck them. That is a direct quote from him. That may be what I feel, but that was what he actually said. Now, the situation of Ocelin is compared to that of Nelson Mandela. Bad comparison. During his time in Robben Island, Mandela was among his own comrades for much of the time. And when his release came about, it was a directive. A directive. Negotiations were ongoing and had been ongoing. The South African regime were a tiny part of that. 
a tiny part of it. They only remained in power because the global conglomerate did not authorize otherwise. Once it was time to finish, it finished. The deals and partnership were in place. Mandela was released in 1990. The ANC was unbanned in the same year. Mandela had a country to go to. The ANC exiles had a country to go to. When Ocelin and PKK are unbanned, where will they go? If they don't have a place, can they be unbanned? In order to unravel the nightmare the way I see it, the global state must return to the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and review the deals done during the First World War and after the First World War. A solution will be negotiated if the global authorities decide on that. Russia will play a part as they did before and after the October Revolution. The solution won't be weighted in favor of the Kurdish people. Whatever they get will be bestowed upon them as an act of philanthropy. For this to happen, the will of the Turkish people will be necessary. And here again, we should distinguish between the people and the state. It's very important to remember tradition and radical history. And the more I see that side of the Turkish history as part of radical history. Kemal Ataturk respected the British state. He knew it was a con. British politicians are always attacking each other, but only within office hours. Out of office hours, they're the best of friends, working for the good of England. Kemal's perception of the relationship between state and government was precise. And it was that perception of Kemal and the Young Turks that transformed the country, Ottoman Turkey, you might say, into a nation state. It really should be remembered what they did at that time. Religion was clogging the machinery of the state. Kemal closed the monasteries, dissolved their organizations. He destroyed the whole religious basis, the old laws, the social life, the caliph and the sultan dumped them. Etiquette, hierarchy, the social niceties dumped them. In laying the foundations of the modern Turkish state, Kemal Ataturk revolutionized the status of the family, the rights of ownership, he forbade polygamy in the harem, produced a children's bill, regulated the employment of children, encouraged women to shed their veils and come out into the open. Women ceased to be chattels owned by their husbands, became individuals and free citizens and members of Kemal's own political party. That's the reality, on an equal footing with men. He helped them become doctors, lawyers. Two became judges. Four elected to the municipal council. That's why I see it as radical history. How much of this do we know, those of us from outside? Not very much. The British, the French, United States would have seen Kemalism as a form of communism. Remember at that time, Churchill wanted to bomb Russia just the way he firebombed and destroyed Iraq with chemical weapons. He wanted to do the same thing in India the English hero. The people of Turkey value their own history and we have to actually, I feel very strongly about this, I've been involved in this, 
now for a long number of years. If it's not valued, we cannot expect solidarity. And it's a failure to face up to the reality of that situation. Giving support is different from acting in solidarity. Giving support can be a charitable gesture. The one who gives the support has a surplus in energy, time, material resources. Acting in solidarity is not to act charitably. In life or death struggle, there is no surplus. Everything is on the line. Support is welcome, but not necessary. Charity exists through the commodification of empathy. The state transforms it into a property, into a thing. Empathy is not a thing. It is a relationship. Empathy describes primary relationships between human beings. Solidarity derives from empathy. On the subject of human rights, I am cautious. Any campaign on rights is an appeal to authority. In appealing to authority, we concede its authority. It is a concession. In most every case, to say that a human being has rights is to make a judgment on the nature of humanity. When we petition the state for so-called human rights, we are asking the state to bestow upon us our own fucking humanity. The state donates our humanity as a charitable gesture, as an act of benevolence. When human beings are locked up for life, the state is not withdrawing their rights. The state is denying their humanity. When we're kids, we enter into the world as a distinctive kind of being. This world we enter is not a new world to us. It is the only world. We cannot compare how things are to how they have been. We have no past. We are newborn. Each moment we live creates its own past. We do not have the right to eat and drink. If we don't, we die. We do not have the right to breathe in and breathe out. If we don't, we die. We do not have the right to exercise our brains and our bodies. If we don't, our bodies do not function properly. Hearing, seeing, touching, tasting, speaking, these are not rights bestowed upon us. They are primary elements of our humanity, of our existence, our survival as individuals our survival as a species. Nobody gives these things to us, but they can be taken from us. We learn from the world as it impacts upon us every object or sensation. We learn and we develop. Nothing stands still. We take what we can from those who stand with us and those who have gone before, and we move ahead. The baton is passed, going more deeply, embedded within our communities, inseparable from who we are, coming to terms with the passing of time, the passing of our time. We act in what we know and what is possible for us to know. We do not exist outside of the species. All that we come to know is all that we are. We bring into play our creativity. 
make use of our imagination. That begins and ends here. The expression of all that one person happens to be at each moment in time. Everything that the artist is at the point of creation is there in the composition. This is the essence of our humanity. Capitalism withdraws and denies to us these most fundamental aspects of what it is to be a human being. And that was the insight of Karl Marx. Not only Karl Marx, I would say. He had a very close, uh, uh, no, I wouldn't say a colleague, but uh, Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher who had a, similar ideas. I think he was six years older than Karl Marx. But Marx, Marx, the great insight of Marx, these are not rights. These are not bestowed upon us by a benevolent authority. Nobody gives us these things. The tyrant withdraws them. Our lives are dead and humanity denied us. I have never been in prison, but I'm a human being. I don't have to suffer and experience directly to have an understanding of it. It works through empathy. Empathy is an expression of our humanity. Empathy is that fundamental attribute that the nation state seeks to control. I think I might just end up, uh, I'm going to, I think I'll just end up. I realize I'm going a bit long. I'm going to just uh, finish by reading the poem that I mentioned. That, that was dedicated to uh, the 44th anniversary of the PKK. And as I said to uh, one of the, somebody in here, before the shift from Marxist-Leninism, I was able to give PK support, which I did do. But once they stopped the Marxist-Leninism, I gave them a solidarity. <laughs> So this is the poem that Estella Schmidt dedicated to Abdul Ochoan. You taught me what is inevitable in life for new life to grow. It's a tiny sun whose roots I'll have to water well and encourage it to deploy its own attack against the weeds. Tiny wretched bread of solidarity, a banner against the cold fresh water for the blood maternal elements that should not stray far from the heart, against melancholy, trust, against despair, the voice of the people, rattling the windows of the sacred house to discover, decipher, articulate, set the motion. The ancient duties of fighters and liberators now become our obligations, are out and about measuring our steps from breakfast to sleep, from stealth to stealth, from action to action, from life to life. Well, thanks for that.